Well, here we are again. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me now. I tried to help someone hear me and it, uh, I think, dropped out and finished the video instead. So hopefully everybody will be joining me in just a moment. Um, we were having a really good start too, so I'm going to try to re-say some of the things I already said because we were already starting to teach a little bit and setting up what God's going to do in this time with us tonight. So uh, I wanted to encourage everybody that as you are watching these on YouTube, that you can make comments below. That would be really awesome. But if you do happen to go to the Facebook Live uh, where the video is uploaded after the time where it's live, that you can make comments even at that point. So that is really a, a good thing to do. Hi, Brother Juan. Good to see you. We were on, and then uh, we had a little technical error, so I am kind of restarting. So uh, we'll have everybody else probably jumping in just hopefully again in just a moment. But uh, I was also explaining that all of, all of you that are watching these videos, there are handouts and outlines that you can get if you go to gateviewministries.com to the events page. Uh, there are now five handouts that go with what we're teaching on Tuesday night. And so I was going to go over those with you, but maybe I'll wait for a few seconds to see if we have some others come back in again. Oh, we do have five here. Anna's back. Anna and Ron are back. And I'm sure Amanda and John and everybody else will be joining us too. So uh, because this is going to replay, I don't want to lose anybody in the replay. So I'm going to go ahead and go on here. But anyway, maybe we need to make sure before anything else that we have the breaker anointing. And that was in what we had started to say a few minutes ago before we had technical difficulties. Yay, Sherry's back. So... Um, the breaker anointing is what our Jesus came to do. He came as the fulfillment of Messiah. Everything in the Old Covenant points towards Jesus coming, Messiah coming. Yeshua is his Hebrew name. Yeshua means salvation. And there are places in Isaiah where uh, Yeshua or salvation is mentioned. And it says, my salvation. And in that case, it's Yeshua T. He's my salvation. We need to make it personal, don't we? Our relationship with the Lord is a personal um, thing that we, we want to nurture. And, and I love him so much that I want to know all I can about him. And as we look at these things tonight, I, I am going to go ahead and tell you that on Facebook, uh, you, I put a notice that you can go and download the outlines for this class. And there's a total of five now. So I'm just going to go over those real quickly. If you do go to gateviewministries.com to the events page, the first one that you can download, which we just really finished going through, but if you do go back and look at those videos, or if you just want to have all the notes that we have, then you can get this, which was the introduction, the prayer shawl in intercession. And we took a lot of time in investigating why are Hebrew roots applicable to us? Why would a Christian study these things? And then the next handout that I have for you on there is a um, something that I talked a little bit, quite a bit about. I think we did one whole lesson on it. And that is the Genesis of Yeshua. And I have all this research here that's a handout about all the generations of, of Jesus that are listed in Matthew, the first chapter verses 1 through 17 and it breaks down how that we are grafted in because there's 42 generations but yet only 43 are listed so you and I are the missing generation and we are the ones according to Psalms it says in Psalms 22 that a seed shall serve him it will be counted to the Lord for a generation okay the next handout that I have for you is what we're going to start tonight so if you haven't already downloaded or printed it out, uh, you can do so later. Maybe just have a pen or in your Bible on hand because we're really going to be getting into the Word. But this next section that you can download is Symbolism and Typology. And one of the things that I was saying before we had technical difficulties is that uh, knowing the language of God's Word 
how that he taught, he used symbolism and typology, how that there are shadows. Uh, I didn't mention shadows before, but there are shadows in the old covenant that are bring, looking forward to the light being the fulfillment of it through Yeshua. So there's so much more of that that we'll be talking about, and it's really exciting. So that is the handout we're going to start tonight on symbolism and typology. And then... The other one that I put on last night that I felt, this happened yesterday. I was praying for some of the people that I just love so dearly. And especially the Lord spoke to me about Romans 8, 31 through 39. Hi, John. Hi, Amanda. I think we're getting everybody back again. And I think, is Michael here? How awesome would that? Hi, Michael Murphy. Good to see you too. And probably Ken and Kim are here as well. So we're having a good family Bible study tonight. But I wanted to tell all you guys, if you can, go to that GateViewMinistries.com, the events page. And I want to show you this that I worked on yesterday for you. Uh, the, this was inspired by some of the uh, people that I pray for. And I won't list names right now. But I'm just going to tell you that there is a powerful thing that you can do when you pray personally Romans 8. 31 through 39 and I want to have you guys go there and download this and put your name in here and just real briefly I want to tell you things like this because when we when we take the word of God personally that God goes in into our personal situations and he becomes active see everything by the Lord is by the word and by our faith and so when we activate and we speak things out by the way, did you know the Word of God was really meant to be read aloud? Uh, and not just silently to yourself, of course, you know, if you're at work or different places where you do have to read silently. But when you're at home by yourself, I want to encourage you to read the Word of God out loud. There's something about your mouth speaking it. It really accomplishes the same thing as the purpose of praise. Because when we praise the Lord with our mouth, our ears hear it, and our heart starts to believe it, and it just takes on a greater depth and resonance to it, and really becomes more grounded or ingrained into our lives. So with this Romans 8, 31 through 39, for example, it says, what then, and I'm going to put my name in here just to give you an example, what then will Pamela say about these things? If God is for Pamela... Who is against Pamela? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for Pamela. How will he not also with him grant Pamela everything? So I want to really encourage you to go on and get this and see if this doesn't change your perspective of what God wants to accomplish in and through you. Okay? Um, and then the other handout that is already on the face on, excuse me, on our website is one that we probably won't get to for several months, but I wanted to go ahead and put it on there so that people could already have all three handouts that go with what we're talking about with symbolism and typology about what we're going to study about prayer and intercession having to do with the prayer shawl. And uh, I wanted to have this in the shot tonight and let you start seeing a little bit about what this prayer shawl looks like. Because we're going to be talking about the symbolism and the typology and what God has for us in this. And you're going to be surprised how much of this is in the New Testament. You know, I've heard Christians say, oh, I'm a New Testament. I'm in the era of, gra era of grace. Not error, but era of grace. Hopefully they're not in the error of grace. Uh, that would be when it goes to hyper grace, but we won't talk about that right now. But when we live right now, yes, God's enabling unmerited divine enablements. His grace is for us. Hallelujah. That is so exciting that we do have the grace of the Lord. But this is what I'm really burdened about, and this is part of what I feel called to in ministry. I think that it's really sad that a lot of Christians don't know, don't know what he came to fulfill. 
don't know what grace is all about because we don't have an accurate understanding of the law. See, God wants us to love the law. Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Hmm. If any of us have a tendency to get offended, maybe there's something that we need to reconnect to in understanding the law of the Lord because I realize how many times I have messed up so I can have grace for others. And that's especially what I need to do. I need to have grace for the others that are God's children. Amen. So uh, as we look at this, the, the last third part that you can already download is called the secret place. And as you know, I give a lot of side comments and I'm teaching this more thoroughly than I ever have because most of the time when I go places, I just have to hit the bullets and send home the handout with people. I call them doggy bags because, see, I'm sending meat home with people. <laughs> have you ever been to a really good restaurant and you have too much steak and you're already full, so you get a doggy bag so you can take meat home with you? Well, that's what I see handouts as. And um, that's why I really feel called to write and to do the things that I'm doing on the written page. Because there's not enough time in our time here together on Facebook Live on Tuesday nights that I can cover everything that I want to cover. But I, I am taking it slower this time and giving you a lot of the side comments in the depth of things that God has shown me along the way. Oh, you know what? That's one other thing I wanted to point out about um, the prayer the believer's triumph i took a lot of time yesterday and do you see this whole side here is cross references that go with these verses over here that you're going to declare and proclaim and uh, decree for yourself okay so uh i put a lot of time into these things and i do it because i love you guys and i have such a desire that you could have the same loving, trusting, faithful relationship that I have with the Lord. That's what I so desire, is if I could just somehow transfer to others the love that I have for my Jesus and why I love Him to the depth that I do. You know, that's what His salvation is all about. He saved me from myself. Hey, Michael, love you too, man. I'm so glad you're here tonight. So, uh, hey, call me sometime, okay? I want to talk to you. Uh, I believe God has great things in store for you, Michael. Michael, you're an awesome man, and there is a blessing and a heritage on you. And I am here for you to do all I can to help you to fulfill your divine destiny. Amen. You guys, you know, these names that you see of others, if you don't know them, Maybe make a mental note. Pray for each other during the week. Hey, Brother Carlos is here tonight. Hallelujah, Brother Carlos. I haven't seen you for a while. You guys, thanks for all the hearts. I love you. And uh, I'm going to get going for tonight on this, on the symbolism and typology. And I want you to do look in two places. If you have your Word of God with you. Uh, and I know some of you are watching your phones right now, and that may be where you also have your Bible. So I'm going to be going to two, specifically two places tonight that I want you to go ahead and mark. Or if you want to go ahead, if you have a regular, you know, book, Bible, uh, that you could look at these two places. I want you to turn to John 3 and also 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And you're going to be surprised and amazed how that this ties into the prayer shawl. And it's going to unfold before you, and this is where we're going to go tonight. Okay, so we want to understand these things because then it causes us to realize the gift of Yeshua all the more to us. So I gave you a chance there to look in your Bible. So if you are in John 3, did you know... Probably most of you, if I asked you, you know, to tell me a famous verse in the Bible, immediately most people would probably say John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
Now, I love the 17th verse, too. But before I get there, I want to take you back up to the 9th verse. Okay? In John 3, 9, it says, How can these things be? asked Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus was a teacher of the law. He was a Jewish rabbi. And in this story, in fact, when you look... And uh, I'm going to go there and look at it on my computer. Uh, in John 3, it starts off with the beginning of the chapter where Jesus and Nicodemus are having a conversation. So we're going to kind of go into the middle of the conversation. So Jesus is asked by Nicodemus, how can these things be? And then verse 10 says, are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Jesus replied, well... That almost makes me want to go back up to the beginning of the chapter because I want you guys to get the full concept here. So I am going to go to the very beginning of the chapter. So let's do a lot of Bible reading right now. I hope you don't mind me reading so much. But it's going to help you understand the concept of what we're talking about. So John 3 verse 1 says, There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, so Nicodemus, a teacher and a rabbi himself of the Pharisees, he acknowledged Jesus as a rabbi. That's one of the remises there that we've talked about. That's a suggestion of, of what we can you know, perceive out of the story. And then it says, we know that you have come from God as a teacher or as a rabbi, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. Jesus replied, I assure you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 4, but how can anyone be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked him, can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Verse 5. Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is, from, is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be, do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases. So that's a type of the Holy Spirit. The Ruach. The breath of God. The wind of God. The wind blows where it pleases. And you hear its, its sound. But you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is at, with everybody or everyone who is born of the Spirit. Born of the Spirit. You know, that is a good way that if anybody ever asks you, how do you know there's a God? You can't see him. He's invisible. And when you look at the, you know, when you try to see God, he's invisible to the eye because our God is a Spirit and they that worship him worship him in spirit and in truth. But if you ever have an agnostic, which are those that doubt or wonder if there's really a God, and then there's atheists who say there's no God, they absolutely think they know. Here's the example that you can give them. How do you know there's wind? You can't see wind, but you can see the effects of wind. When you look outside and you see the trees bowing over and the bushes blowing like this and the flowers kind of lifting their heads and up and down in the breeze. You may see a tumbleweed here in Arizona skip down the street. And that's how that you know that there's wind is by the evidence and the effects of the wind. Well, this is what Jesus, our Yeshua, is calling to the attention of Nicodemus. Now I'm finally at verse 9 where I was going to start with you guys. But wasn't that good? All of that extra. It's so important that we read the Word of God in context. In fact, I like to say we look to see where it's couched. Where does it sit? Where is it enthroned? What, what truth? We don't just excerpt truth. Because if we do and we just try to apply things to what we're trying to, improve, uh, to prove, then what we are doing is we're making God's word 
fit us instead of God doing something where he's reshaping us and remolding us and helping us to become like him. So it's so important that we look to see where we are. Let's see, Sherry made a comment. How do, we, how do you keep your lungs working? By breathing, by taking deep breaths. That's good. That's a good point, too. We need the Ruach. We need the breath of God. We need the wind of God. Okay, now I'm at verse 9. How can these things be? Said Nicodemus. Are you a teacher of Israel? Yeshua said to him. So how are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Verse 11. I assure you, we speak what we know and we testify we witness we prophesy we speak for god we testify it's a legal sense we give testimony so we testify to what we have seen but you do not accept our testimony if ha if i have told you about these things that happen on earth and you don't believe how will you believe it if i tell you about the things of heaven you know, we hear a lot about heaven, and I love the Lord's Prayer when it says that the Lord's will will be here on earth as it is in heaven. So we need to enlarge our concept of what heaven is and what heaven means and what the position of heaven is, where we are seated with him in heavenly places, far above all principalities, powers, and dominions, and the workers of darkness of this age. Do you want to be above the, the workers of darkness of this age? Then you need to find your sitting place. Ha! <laughs> we may need to be couched with him, amen? we got to be seated with the Lord. And so it says here, I'm going to pick up again at verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven except the one, that's capitalized in Holman Christian Standard, the one, that's meaning God, God the Father through God the Son, together as one. Jesus said, Father, that they may be one as you and I are one. So the, except the one who, had, who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, it clarifies it there, that it's talking about himself, Messiah, and who, what he would fulfill. Verse 14, just, now here we go. Here's the red lights about the Old Testament. Did you know that this precedes John 3, 16? Did you know the Old Testament is in the New Testament? Listen to this, verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. King James says, just as Moses lifted the brazen serpent. So it's the story of the brazen serpent there. So must the Son of Man be lifted on high, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. We used to sing this, and we would sing, As Moses lifted the brazen serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted on high. He said, If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me lift jesus higher lift jesus higher lift him up for the world to see he said if i be lifted up from the earth i will draw all men unto me this verse goes right before John 3.16. So that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life, it says in verse 15. Now 16. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son. So that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Or eternal life, it says here in Holman. 17. For God, now Lul, that John 3.16, you could camp there and think about it all day long. But I want to encourage you to go to verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world that he might condemn the world, but that through the world through him might be saved. Verse 18, anyone who believes in him is not condemned. But anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Verse 19. This then is the judgment. The light has come into the world. 
the light. We are looking for the light. And we've talked about in, in previous videos and previous times together how that John won and how the Genesis won. They both synchronized together that in the beginning there was God and the life was the light of men. Hallelujah. And now we are going to say that the, we're, we're finding that the Lord wants to put his light within us. And take out every judgment when we accept him, when we believe him, when we receive the sacrifice that he gave to us upon the cross. It says because the darkness or the deeds of darkness were evil. Now verse 20. For everyone who practices wicked things hates the light and avoids it. Did you know that if you're permitting darkness in your life, you're saying that you might have a little more affection for those things than your love for the light of the Lord. Don't we want the light of the Lord to come in and take away all the darkness out of our lives? I want to be, I want to live. Yes, Anna, the, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Lord gives his word to be that light. It, it, it comes in and it shines anything that's dark. And we can repent and get rid of it. The Holy Spirit convicts us of all darkness. Hallelujah. It's a wonderful thing to be convicted by the Holy Spirit. But see, he doesn't condemn us, but he wants to convict us. See, we have this lifetime to come into the alignment of the conviction of the Holy Spirit so that we'll be ready for the judgment. So we'll be ready for the white throne judgment. So I want to encourage you guys that as you are, are listening to these teachings, allow the Lord to cause you to maybe repent from those areas of darkness maybe that you've winked at or flirted with or allowed in your life or you've just even opened the door and said, come on in darkness, let's, let's have our lights become brilliant with his glory, hallelujah. And then verse, uh, I'm going to go ahead and read 20 again because I want to put it in concept, in content, content. Uh, for everyone who practices wickedness, wicked things, hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. Verse 21, but anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. God wants to be at work in our lives. The light of his word, that lamp that comes and shines brilliantly through his word so that by his grace he shows us where we have fallen short of the glory of God. But it's not so that we maintain being short of the glory of God, but he wants us to Repent and turn away from all of that darkness so that we can live in the light of his glorious gospel. Hallelujah. So there did you know that in that very famous section where John 3.16 sits is an understanding about Moses and about what the serpents did when the, when the children of Israel... They murmured and they complained against Moses and Aaron. And what happened? They were, the snakes infiltrated the camp and were biting the people and causing many to die. And so you'll have to read the cross-references for that. In fact, I can give you the cross-references. Uh, Numbers 21, 8 through 9. And then also it's mentioned in Isaiah 11.10 that the Son of Man must be lifted on high. It says in Isaiah 11.10, the root of Jesse will stand as an ensign, a signal or sign or a standard, so that everybody who believes in the Lord can have the bite of sin relieved and reversed out of their life, just as it was with the children of Israel, when those snakes came in, Aaron and Miriam came to Moses and said, what shall we do about the people? How can we cause the people to not die from these serpents that are coming in? And God really had to allow Moses to be the intercessor. That's why what we're talking about has so much to do with intercession. When we intercede for others, it's because 
we may have a greater light of the Holy Spirit that is shining in our life and we can pray with an illuminated knowledge of the truth of God for the affairs of others. And so this is what happened because the sin was really against Moses and the people had murmured and complained. Even with Aaron and Miriam, they had murmured and complained against their brother. So the serpents came in and really it was a typology of the bite of sin taking hold of people. And when that happens, death is the result. It's the consequence. You know, when we have consequences to our actions, then we need also a savior for those actions. So what God told Moses to do was to take and to fashion a brazen serpent, brass, bra or brazen, or which comes from brass, has to do with judgment. And throughout the word of God, if you're taking notes about symbolism and typology, and this isn't on the notes, this is extra, so you might want to write this down. Brass is a type of judgment with grace because it's made out of the same kind of compounds as iron which iron is a symbol of judgment without grace it's hard it's iron but when there's fire that's come to that iron there's a judgment that can come and there's a fire of god that can come but it also brings an activation of god's presence and he is a fire our god is a consuming fire and he brings the fire to burn out all the dross out of our life just like he does when there's gold that's tried by the fire the same thing that happens with brass or something that's brazen so when we see the serpents that were a type of sin biting the people causing death then Moses is told to put a brazen serpent up, judgment with grace. And that's why it says here in John 3, just as Moses lifted the brazen serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted on high. Do you see that when we look at the cross, Jesus was without sin. He totally had the activation of grace within his life. He was totally enabled with the divine attributes of God. He was outwardly a Jew, but he was inwardly Jehovah. And yet when we look at the cross, we see he who took our sin, our shame, the bite of the serpent of sin. And of course, we could go back all the way to Genesis 1, where the serpent is a type of Satan who comes and he nips the heel and he brings sin as a course to the walk of man. You know, there's so much of this. I'm just alluding to a lot of it. But I hope that this is exciting you, how the word of God fits together. And so when we look at that brazen serpent, and so must the Son of Man be lifted on high, I look at Jesus on the cross. He was without sin, but he took my sin. And he gives me his grace. So I look upon the cross and I say thank you for taking the bite of sin, the sting of sin and death. But he overcame it and so can we, hallelujah. So I want you to see some of that. Now, I want us to go into 1 Corinthians 10, 11 through 13. And you know that's my key verses of what I'm going to be moving to. But once again... I'm going to look and see where it sits or where it's couched. So I'm going all the way up to verse 6. It says, Now these things, the things in the Old Covenant, became examples for us so that we will not desire evil things as they did. This is talking about the children of Israel in the wilderness. And how they, and in this case, it's talking about the golden calf. Don't become idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to play. If you want to know the cross references for that, I have them here for you. That's Exodus 32, 4, 6, and 19. But now I'm going to go ahead and pick up with 1 Corinthians verse 8. Let us not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. Remember, we're talking about when Moshe, or Moses, came down from Mount Sinai. He had the Ten Commandments, the two tablets in his hands, and the children of Israel were partying with the golden calf. And there's a lot more to that story that I would love to spend time and to go through all the details. But we'll pick on it, up on it sometimes as, as we're talking here and there. 
so much, especially when we start talking about the glory of God that is made known in Exodus, the 33rd chapter. All of this is so important to see how it forms together. So verse 8 here in 1 Corinthians 10 says, Let us not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in a single day, 23,000 people fell dead. 9. Let us not test or prove Christ as some of them did. Now isn't that interesting? Here in the New Testament, it's placing Christ back at the time of Moses and the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. There's an understanding here that Yeshua, our Hamashiach, our Messiah, was there from the beginning of the earth, in the foundations of the earth, and he made his appearances known. And by the Ruach HaKodesh, that spirit, that breath of God, the wind of God, he was there as the Godhead. The three parts of God were there. And so let us not test Christ as some of them did and were destroyed by snakes. Verse 10, nor should we complain. Now see, that's a link back to what we read in John 3. They were destroyed by snakes. Verse 10, nor should we complain. Uh-oh. When I was studying to have this time with you guys and I got to that verse, I thought of where it says, do all things without complaining. we got to be so careful. Our words have power, right? God's created power is in the word. And like I was telling you a while ago, we read the word of God alive and aloud. <laughs> alive and aloud. Hallelujah. So don't complain. Do not complain that as some of them did and were killed by the destroyer. That could be a key why sometimes the destroyer has power in our life. If we're complaining, you see, that's activating faith in the fear of what you're complaining about instead of speaking forth the faith of the Word of God and His promises, precepts, and principles in our situations. So we're not going to give power to the destroyer. Verse 11, now these things happened to them as examples, and they were written as a warning to us on whom the ends of the ages come. Verse 12, so whoever thinks he stand must be careful not to fall. Now, verse 13, I use this so much in counseling situations, and it sits right smack dab in an understanding of Old Testament, Old Covenant, Tanakh, Revelation, in the New Testament. Now here's this important verse. And I encourage you to memorize this verse. Verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. And he will not allow you to be tempted beyond that that you are able but with the temptation he will also provide a way of escape so that you are able to bear it here's what we got to do when we find ourselves in a in a situation of temptation don't walk into it and become come into agreement with it but turn around and go the other direction and walk back into his marvelous light hey in this verse Verse 13, there's a couple of words that I want to enlarge for our understanding. Because it's just going to, as my nephew Christopher does, poo. <laughs> when we study the Word of God and it just gets so great, he'll go, poo. Um, if this is mind exploding, okay? So I'm going to build up and I'm going to go back into that verse 10 and let's enlarge it. So no temptation. Let me tell you what a temptation is. It's a testing it's a trial. When you have a temptation, you don't just give in to it. You see it as a test or something to overcome. It's an experiment. And why God's allowing you to walk through it is not because he wants you to fall to it. No, he doesn't want you to get into condemnation. He wants to convict you at the beginning of the test or the trial, that experiment, that test, 
He's wanting you to see it as an opportunity to prove that you are great and there's an overcomer in you. And you are more than an overcomer through him who loved you. So nothing, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. And then I love this. The very first thing it says then after that about talking about what a test and a trial and a tribulation and a proving is, an affliction or a calamity, is that God is faithful. Do you know that in the test, God is giving you an opportunity to be faithful like he is faithful. And here, let me enlarge the word faithful to you. It literally means to be persuaded, loyal to faith, reliable, trustworthy, believing in what he has imparted. God has given you truth. The fact that you're here with me during this time of study right now shows me that you have a truth and a deep calling to deep. That tells me that you are desiring to be more than an overcomer. You're wanting to be faithful like God is faithful. And that you are persuaded. And that you're seeking how that you might be loyal as he has been loyal to you. You know, he's our very present help in the time of our need. Amen. But with the temptation, with the trial, with the opportunity in affliction or calamity, those are opportunities that he will provide a way of escape. Here's the way of escape. Sometimes we have to be the ones that choose to open the door, which is also Christ Jesus, open up his truth into our life and walk into the alignment with that instead of the darkness that we're being tempted with or tried with. There's nothing in this life that we cannot walk out with the faithfulness of the Lord. And yes, I can say this. Some of us have messed up. I've messed up. There's, I'm ne I never can be preachy to other people because there's been times where I've totally messed up. And I have not been walking in God's faithfulness. But yet I know my God is faithful. And what he wants to do is he wants to have me come back into alignment with his faithfulness. And we do that by his word. Amen. Um, then I, I really, that's what I mostly wanted to cover tonight. But regarding the talit now, the prayer shawl, I'm going to end tonight by having us look at where this is commanded. And it's commanded in the Torah. It's commanded with Moses. It's part of what God, and this is what you're just going to, it's going to really illuminate everything that we've read in John 3 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Okay, look with me in Numbers, the 15th chapter, and it's 37 through 41. Yes, Sherry, that's good. His mercy endures forever. Hallelujah, his mercy triumphs every sin. He is so faithful. Yes, he is, Judy. Yes, hallelujah. Juan Sor, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Maybe I should just stop there for a moment before I go into Numbers. I'm giving you a chance to go into Numbers 15. But let's just pray here and let's apply what we've already read and studied. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you, as God... And Father of us all, you were tempted in all ways like unto us, but you had no sin. There was nothing that separated you from the divine image that man was created in. Lord, we, we know that man was created in your image, but because of sin we became separated from your character and from your attributes. And so, Lord, we look at the cross right now. And we thank you for taking the cross for each one of us. Lord, I thank you for taking the cross for me so that my sin, you bore my sin upon the cross. The sting of sin, the, the bite of sin of the serpent. Lord, you took that so that I wouldn't have to live that way. Lord, you took it all for me so that I could live eternally. Lord, I receive your mercy. I receive your grace. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to just, I feel the Holy Spirit upon me and I'm going to speak in tongues because I'm so 
grateful for the Ruach HaKodesh because Jesus took the cross. He left the Holy Spirit for us too. I encourage you guys to be with the, allow the Holy Spirit to breathe into you, to bring his winds of the Holy Spirit to you, to revive you and to give you life and that more and to abundantly, to feel the effects, to know the effects of the wind, the Ruach of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. For maybe some of those of you that don't have the evidence of the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues, maybe we'll have to do a teaching on that sometime too. Because we're talking about prayer. The Holy Spirit is one of the things that we have as a gift that allows us to pray when we don't know how to pray. Right then why I wanted to speak in tongues is I'm so grateful and I love the Lord so much that my chosen words, my English language is not enough. It's not enough to say, oh my Jesus, I'm so grateful for your mercy and your grace for your salvation. And after a while, there's, there's just, there's not, it's insufficient to say what I feel for him. See, that's one of the reasons why the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues is so vital and important for us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Okay, so... I'm going to quickly <laughs> go on now to Numbers 15. And let me just say this, first of all. Numbers 15, verses 37 through 41, where it tells about the tassels for remembrance. The prayer shawl for remembrance. It sits right in the middle of two chapters, Numbers 14 and Numbers 16, they talk about the rebellion of Israel. So right in the middle of there, God wants to give Israel an idea and an understanding and a way to remember the commandments of the Lord. The law of the Lord. The instruction. See, law again is not legalistic. It's instruction. It's teaching. So there, are you with me now? Numbers 15, 37. The Lord said to Moses... Speak to the Israelites and tell them that throughout their generations they are to make tassels for the corners of their garments and put a blue cord on the tassel at each corner. Verse 39, there will, there, these will serve as tassels for you to look at so that you may remember <coughs> all the Lord's commands. And obey them and not become unfaithful. Do you see how this ties back into 1 Corinthians 10, 13? So that they will not become unfaithful by following your own heart and your own eyes. See, that's where the temptations are. We're going to talk more about these things. I'm just introducing this for you tonight. And then verse 40 says, this way you will remember and obey all my commands and be holy to your God. Verse 41. I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am Yahweh your God. So in the next few weeks we're going to be talking about all the symbolism and typology of the prayer shawl. How it's constructed what it shares for us, what it reminds us of. Am I saying that everybody's going to have to start wearing a prayer shawl? No, I'm not saying that. Just like everything else in the Word of God with the feast and everything, we have a fulfillment in Yeshua. But, you know, there, are, there, is, uh, there is some uh, really power to maybe at some point, if you do have a prayer shawl, uh, I know that when I went through cancer, and uh, I was going through chemo and everything, and I was so sick. My mother would come in my room, and she would pray, and she would place the prayer shawl over me in my bed. 
And so there's something about coming underneath the covering of the Lord. So again, we're not going to become legalistic or ruled by law with this. But if we know what the symbols and the typology means, then there are times that we can access it. Just like when I know the names of God in the Hebrew, it helps me in my prayer life. If I know he's Jehovah Shammah, he's the Lord who is there. It doesn't mean that I always have to pray and make sure that I include Jehovah Shammah. But in my prayer at times, I say Jehovah Shammah. And I realize that wherever I am, he is there. He is my very present help. And so we're not going to look at this as legalism. We're going to look at this as life giving. And for our understanding so that we can know more about Yeshua, how he was lifted up as a brazen serpent, how that he fulfilled everything for us on the cross. But we're going to understand that the grace and the things that he has provided for us causes us to live in remembrance of, his, of the commands of the Lord. Why? So that we can be like God that we were created in the image of. So that we don't fall short. And that's where I'm going to end tonight. I hope I'm, I'm making you excited and giving you a little appetizer. Uh, see if you can get the downloads for the PDFs on the website. And I just want to say again, I love and appreciate all of you guys. Thank you. Thank you for being with me here on Tuesday nights. And remember, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful to make a way of escape for you. So don't look to walk into the tribulation and the testing, but find out the access and the escape route that God has for you. And you know who it's going to be through? It's going to be through the door, our Christ Jesus. I'm just feeling like I, I want to bless you guys tonight as I'm leaving. And I'm saying the priestly blessing over you. With my hands, I'm doing the letter Sheen. What stands for Shaddai. He's the one who's all sufficient. And I'm going to say over you. Just like Jesus did when he ascended in Luke 24 verse 50. It says he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. Just as Jesus did this. I believe that he fulfilled the priestly blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom. Bashem Yeshua HaMashiach and the name of Jesus and the Shem, the name of Jesus our Messiah. We all receive it, believe it, and will you say with me, Amen.